and women's participation in its deliberations and implementation. We have also dug more deeply into patriarchal structures and their relationship with feminist perspectives in disarmament discourses. And we have also heard and learned from women from grassroots organizations who are implementing disarmament on the ground, um, including those from the Middle East, from Central and West Africa and Latin America. And you can find all of the recordings for these webinars on our website too. The project's objectives overall are to raise awareness of the achievements and contributions of women who are working in the field with a focus on women from the global south to encourage us as far as possible diversity and inclusivity in our analysis and our learning. And the Feminist Disarmament Project, um, we also aim to look at structural and practical obstacles facing women who are working in the field. Thank you, Nancy, for the introduction to Scrap Weapons and to this webinar series. Uh, my name is Eva Noor, and I'm the other coordinator and moderator for this webinar and also a researcher at Scrap Weapons. I'm really excited to have you all here and to learn from our panelists who have agreed to share their knowledge and expertise with us. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this webinar specifically. During the last few decades, we believe that there has been a significant improvement at the global, national and local levels in ensuring that women have more important role in decision-making sphere when it comes to peace building and disarmament. However, needless to say that there remains considerable work to be done to ensure that women from all areas of the globe have the practical and financial support to be able to occupy a high position and have a meaningful participation in decision-making. This webinar aims to understand how women can enter and progress in the field. We aim to explore the challenges and obstacles that women face as they enter and progress in the field of disarmament. Questions that will be explored include, what are the trends and funding available for women and why? What education and training opportunities for women striving to enter the field exist? What are the practical and cultural challenges for women in disarmament discourse, policy and practice? The webinar aims to place this theme within a broader socio-political context, drawing in particular on the regional experiences and advice from established institutions, which provide training and mentoring in peace building and disarmament for women. But now, let me tell you a bit more about the structure of the webinar. We will first hear from Kayla McGill from Women in International Security, WISE, whose presentation will focus on the general trends in funding for women-led organizations. Then, our next three panelists will focus on the training opportunities and obstacles in their region and the work they have done the past few years with the organization to tackle such challenges. We will first hear from Suha Madi from Human Security Initiative Organization and from Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. She will talk mostly about Sudan and East Africa. Then, it will be followed by Armel Nongo from Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Cameroon, WILPS, we will talk about Cameroon and West Africa. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Minakshi Gopinath from Women in Security, Conflict Management and Peace. And she'll talk about India and South Asia. Do not hesitate to ask questions if you have them uh, in the chat during the presentation as there will be a Q&A at the end. But now let me introduce our first speaker that you can see on the screen, Kayla McGill. She's the program manager and a fellow at Women in International Security where she oversees project and programming. She conducts research and analysis, contribute to strategic initiatives across the organization. Kayla is a trained analytical researcher focusing on gender and international security, culture and narrative studies, and Eastern European tr tribalism. Kayla previously worked for the Women's Stats Project, contributing to, to publication and US congressional testimonials, working with qualitative and quantitative data and representative representing the project at events such as Beijing Plus 20, CSW 59 at the United Station. Kayla, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much, Ivano, for that um, introduction. And thank you, Nancy, for having me and for Scrap Weapons for having me today. I'm truly looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and discussing this important topic. 
I'm also really happy to be representing WISE today as much of the work we do focuses on promoting women's leadership and professional development in this field. And a key component of our work is in conducting research and policy engagement initiatives in critical international security issues, including the nexus between gender and security. Also as a nonprofit organization, this topic hits especially close to home. So as even Noah said, I will be giving a broad overview and kind of discussing a few main trends in funding for women-led organizations and gender-focused organizations in just disarmament, peace, and security. There's a few main trends that I wanna go over and there's good news and bad news. So first looking at the good news and the positive trends. Gender mainstreaming is becoming more accepted in organizations such as the UN. The UN Office for, Office for Disarmament Affairs or UNODA has been active these past few years and has been working with partners such as other international organizations like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and a lot of civil society actors to promote women in disarmament. Their disarmament fellowships are particularly noteworthy in this regard. And in 2016, they actually updated their gender mainstreaming action plan. More generally, UN women's funding increased in 2019 by about 20 million US dollars. And additionally, bilateral aid from UN states directed towards women's organizations stayed, has stayed steadily about 0.2% of all bilateral funding. That's about $96 million on average. The private sector is also becoming a lot more prevalent in funding gender initiatives. Foundations like the Ford Foundation or the Gates Foundation typically spend between 17 to 20% of their human rights funding on gender and equality issues around the world. In the arms control and disarmament field, mention needs to be made of the Plowshares Fund as well. It has pledged $1 million to greater gender diversity and disarmament through research and other opportunities. Additionally, there are groups like the Gender Champions in Disarmament and the Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy that are based at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And this brings together organizations to promote a gender balance and gender perspective in the field. Close to 70 organizations have already adopted the gender pledge, gender parity pledge um, by the Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy as well. So next going to the the somewhat bad news and the not so positive trends. Unfortunately, the amount of funding directed towards gender focused initiatives and organizations in the field remains limited to put it frankly. For example, between 2017 or 2014 to 2017, each year less than 1% of bilateral aid specifically meant for gender equity actually reached women's rights organizations around the world. And of that global funding, typically only 8% went to civil societies in developing countries. Additionally, less than 3% of the US State Department's budget is allocated for gender equity or women's led organizations or initiatives. And between 2018 and 2020, gender funding from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or the OECD constituted only around six to 9% of its budget. In some funding for all gender initiatives or organizations is typically anywhere between 1% to 9% of budget allocations. Of note, certain topics and issues in the gender peace and security realm are typically awarded more funding from this limited allocation than others. According to preliminary reports from the Peace and Security Index, 2019 global funding and grants from a variety of international donors Focus on, gender initiatives, focus on gender initiatives and disarmament is a much lower percentage, with some numbers pointing to a mere $10,000 of grant money going towards gender disarmament issues in all of 2019, compared to around $50,000 for gender and national security, or $6.9 million for gender equity. One of the problems in this area is what's known as the trickle-down effect. Essentially, funding doesn't always reach those that it's intended for in its original large amounts, and even when it does, there's little to no finalized reporting on it. 
for example, funding from the OECD countries typically goes to a first level funder. And of that, a third of those first level funders are located in the United States, which is another discrepancy. Um, and those first level funders then disperse it. Compounding this issue is that many of those recipients of so second or third or fourth level recipients don't have a lot of data reporting capabilities. And so there's typically no way to know where the money ends up after it leaves the first level recipients. So all of these trends show that with little to support and no clear funding, there's less incentive to incorporate gender into programming or the analysis of these international peace and security challenges. In 2020, WISE published the Gender and Security Scorecard, a spotlight on the nuclear security community, and that link will be in the um, chat for anybody who'd like to see it. And this examined about 32 US think tanks and 16 international journals focusing on research experts and programs that include nuclear security and gender. We found that of all of the 32 think tanks, only one actually integrated gender into its programming. And most of the articles written in the international journals focused on prominent women, not on gender perspectives. And that's not how gender really shapes policy or practices, just focusing on women, which is prominent women. So before I wrap up, I want to share a couple of remarks on the underlying factors that influence these funding trends. One of the biggest factors that influences funding is that gender is still not taken seriously by those in power. There's, this is an overarching trend in all areas of security and peace, and one that feminist scholars have written extensively about. But the bottom line is that when an issue is not deemed by, vital by those in security and those in power, it is not funded or promoted. And when people in decision-making circles do not see the importance of promoting women's leadership or of organizations that incorporate a gender perspective in things such as disarmament or security, they will not fund them. We do now have data in the broader peace and security realm that shows that when women are included and the gender perspective is applied, outcomes are better and they're more effective. This empirical data and research should motivate policymakers and funders to take seriously both women's leadership and the application of a gender perspective when considering international peace and security issues, including arms control and disarmament. A second underlying factor has to do with the increase in new technologies. And I'm really glad, Nancy, you mentioned something about this earlier because this is a big, a big issue. As is typical in many security or areas of security and peace building, women do not make up a large portion of experts in the emerging, emerging cyber technologies or weapons fields. This leads to a lack of women's leadership and voices in this area that has immense cross-cutting focus that impacts all areas of peace and security. This is an area where efforts to increase the number of women and women's leadership should be supported and focused on because since this is a relatively new and emerging issue, we have the potential of getting it right at the start. Related to these new technologies is financial reporting and long-term funding. Smaller nonprofits and women-led organizations and grant recipients must be able to utilize new technologies such as data collection and analysis or tools such as that to provide metrics for success. There's a trend that shows that organizations or individuals which utilize this type of tech to provide hard statistics on progress are more likely to gain continued funding and larger grants. Unfortunately, most nonprofits or organizations lack the capacity to either train staff or even to utilize this technology, and they're frequently not even given the opportunity to try and do so by potential funders. So while technology has become more of a daily tool due to the pandemic and the virtual world we live in, many organizations face discrepancies in access to technology and in capacity to to utilize it. So training and capacity building regarding new tech has far reaching consequences to these fields and they're consistently underfunded. A final underlying factor has to do with the influences of crises on funding. Funding is frequently redirected from gender and women-led organizations or issues in times of crises. 
Unfortunately, we're seeing this play out in the form of a global pandemic today, where many women-led and gender equality organizations that focus on disarmament, peace, and security are either at risk or have already had to close their doors due to funding restrictions brought about by COVID-19. And this is especially prevalent in lower and middle income countries. A link local report showed that in 2020 of 125 civil society organizations located in low and middle income countries around the world, about 22% of which focused on gender, nearly 45% of those 125 organizations had funding problems and were not able to secure new funders specifically due to the effects of the pandemic. Essentially, funding vital work should not stop during a crisis. Instead, funding for crises should include funding for existing initiatives and women-led and gender organizations that focus on security and development issues. And finally, I would like to emphasize that mentorship and elevating new generations of leaders, scholars, and policymakers in this field is key to sustain change and peace. Wise is proud to have been mentoring young women to enter the field for over 35 years, and we'll continue to do so with the support and help from our partners and other organizations such as um, these wonderful organizations that are represented by um, my fellow panelists. So that kind of is a broad overview of some of the main funding trends and a lot of the underlying um, factors that influence these trends as well. So I really look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and learning a lot from their expertise on the specifics of these challenges and these opportunities in the field. Well, thank you, Kayla, for this great presentation and for a great opening to our webinar outlining the key trends in funding worldwide and how they are linked to training capacities for women, um, which I'm sure we will hear more of from our other panelists. It's great to hear also of positive trends, including the grown recognition of women's vital role in implementing disarmament. However, of course, um, as you spoke um, so eloquently and so greatly on, there is so much more work to be done. So I will now just go ahead and introduce our next panelist um, who unfortunately, as we mentioned, is not able to be here to deliver a live presentation, but we do have a pre-recorded presentation for her. And this is Suher Mahdi Mohi Eladin, who is a Sudanese woman who believes in the role of women in change. Since 2004, she has been working with the Human Security Initiative Organization and is now executive director. The organization is a member of the Middle East and North Africa Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, as well as the International Action Network on Small Arms. So Hare's activities mainly deal with human security perspectives, specifically in relation to small arms and light weapons, the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration program and peace building in Sudan. She has presented many pa papers dealing with such programs and activities, including an article on the role of women in the Sudanese revolution in 2019, which was titled Marching Towards Inclusion in Sudan, and it was published by GPAC. One distinguished project that uh, Suhair has supervised was titled Enhancing the Role of Hakamat on Peacebuilding which targeted influential women in Darfur to change their concepts on peace building, such as through singing and provide them with new terms for peace. We, um, we have posted this in the chat and we uh, encourage you to look at this later, perhaps after the, the webinar. Um, we have also posted a second link, which um, Sahar requested us to do, which is, a study on disarmament research in Darfur, Sudan, um, also coordinated by Suhair. So now we will just wait for the video. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizer of this webinar for the opportunity and the leadership in supporting women in disarmament. My name is Suhair Mahadi 
from Sudan, I work with Human Security Initiative Organization, abbreviation MAMIN, since 2004. I have been working on advancing human security as an alternative to secure, securitized and militarized measure to address conflict in my work. Uh, we organize nationally uh, programs on community security and support women empowerment in arm control and disarmament. We are a member of uh, Middle East and North Africa uh, Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict, uh, International Action uh, International Action Network for Small Arm, IANSA, and Arab Network for Tolerance. Also, MAMEN is a member of the National Focal Points that was established upon the Nairobi Declaration and UN Program for Disarmament. <coughs> If we talk about the importance of women and feminist perspectives for disarmament and peace building, I want to start by bringing the issue of human security into the discussion. Uh, I think this conversation could benefit if we remind themselves, uh, ourselves about uh, the linkage between human security, disarmament, and women peace and security. Uh, undeniably, uh, women and this uh, are this proportionately affected by conflict, not only because they are more likely to get less access to security, but also because they are become subject of war warfare and used to achieve political gains. However, women are also the critical stakeholders in, in, in implementing and advancing human security principles that extend beyond mere disarmament and advance border, uh, border social transformation. Human security inspire a people-centered approach, just like the women peace and security agenda. Uh, it encourages us to look at live people, uh, live people experiences that have been uh, overlooked locked, to overlook to conflict. Uh, women, peace and security and human security tell us if we overlook these experiences, nothing will change. This agenda uh, creates a demand for disarmament action, but not only for disarmament, not only for disarmament action, women, peace and security and human security inspire borders transformation of society. Uh, they make a point that women belong everywhere, in political space, in peace building, in human rights, in disarmament, and in security. Women can play an influential role in peace negotiation and peace building programs. Uh, women also have the analysis needed to raise the awareness of their communities, uh, governments, international stakeholders, uh, on the impact of armed conflict and misuse of small arms and encourage their people for disarmament and armed control. Uh, so, uh, if we focus on education, training and monitoring uh, from an organizational perspective, uh, th that is why in MAMEN we work to provide researches on the uh, interlinkage between human security, disarmament, and human peace and security, and support women to advance their own analysis in their communities and their context, uh, and engage with decision maker on where to focus and what intervention is needed. This work helps us raise awareness about the impact of arm and uh, spread different types of security analysis rooted in human security, community building, and social cohesion. Uh, with these researches we conducted, we supported Sudan TDR program in developing an effective public information and communication strategies for different uh, level of stakeholders and audiences to reduce the proliferation of small arms allied women in their four states. We in Western Sudan work with Hakamad women who are in, uh, uniquely influential in their communities. They compose songs and poet, poetics uh, words to praise or condemn someone. 
it gives them a unique power to mobilize their people, encourage, uh, encourage peace in communities. This is another evidence of the fact that women, when women are given influential position or role, they can meaningfully transform their societies. In this, women do not have to stick to typical women issues. They can, uh, they can and should engage on more complex questions to further advance their transformative analysis. They promote messages of peace, coexistence, and rendering them as moral to tools to address securitization and militarization. This is for those uh, Hakamat women in Western Darfur. Uh, another point we can focus on funding issues. Uh, the ability of society transformation, uh, a lot. Uh, a lot of challenges, however, uh, I concern that uh, lack of adequate funding. Uh, funding uh, is of the, uh, funding, uh, less funding and the quality of funding as well is very lack. In Sudan since 2019, the funding opportunities is declined and even the facilities for training is also uh, related to security and political security. Uh, is, is reduced as well. This is related to security and political situation prevailed since, uh, since that time due to Sudanese revolution, uh, strikes and instability followed by the lockdown due to COVID-19. Uh, it will be uh, a lot of time until we can really understand the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the donorship. It is also not clear to me how the international community is planning to address this issue. Uh, to overcome these funding opportunities, MINAPAC organize uh, and conduct a series of training programs and seminars targeting her members and interested activists. However, another issue is uh, appropriate locally sensitive funding. We normally get the, the money to support some short-term donor priorities, and it does not allow us to develop long-term strategies for transformative changes in, uh, in, our, in our communities. Usually, this fund comes from intermediaries that may or may not understand and support local ownership. Uh, sometimes this money is connected to the goal uh, the intermediaries pursue rather than the goal we need to achieve in, in order to build peace without arm in Sudan, for example. Therefore, I would like to encourage further support of the practical work of bridging the women, peace and security, human security and disarmament together in a way that allow for local ownership and adequately finance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suhair, for this incredibly interesting presentation, which has really exemplified and built on some of the funding and practical issues which Kayla spoke about um, in the beginning. And, you know, you, you've done this through speaking about your experiences in implementing disarmament at the national and local levels in Sudan, and also for highlighting just how critical women are in these processes by contributing to different training programs um, to achieve peace in local communities. So thank you very much for that. And now I will go ahead and introduce our third speaker, who is Armel Ndongo. Armel is a gender specialist. She holds a master's in strategic communication and wrote a thesis in 2016 on the United Nations Security Council Resolutions 1325 in Cameroon. She joined the organization WILP for Cameroon in 2014 with the aim of contributing to breaking gender stereotypes and building a world free of armed conflict. As disarmament coordinator, she encourages women and girls to engage in the field of disarmament 
which has long been a male preserve. Amel firmly believes that no lasting peace can be achieved without women. Now we have um, a PowerPoint that Amel has prepared that hopefully will be posted in the group. It may just be loaded in. Um, we do encourage you please to open this and to follow the PowerPoint as we hear from Armel um, in her presentation now. Thank you. Good morning, dear participants and panelists. I am Armel Ndongo from MIF Cameroon. I am the exam program coordinator. I am proud to attend this webinar where I'm going to talk about the challenges related to the participation of women in Cameroon in the field of disarmament. Before going deep in my presentation, let me say some few words about Youth Cameroon. Youth Cameroon is a civil society organization set up in 2014 in Cameroon. The mission is to end and prevent war and to make sure that all we, uh, to make sure that women are fully involved in all the decision making process. And our vision is a world free of armed conflict. Coming to the security context in Cameroon, what I can say is that in 2000 and since 2013, Cameroon was deeply involved in a series of conflict. At the beginning of the Boko Haram, and now is the Nozo, Northern and Southern crisis. And in those two conflicts, women and girls are very, very affected by the illicit proliferation of, of small arms. You can see in the next slide, you have a, in the, my left, conventional arm, and in my right, my tra traditional arm used by, uh, by terrorists to perpetrate uh, gender-based violence on, on girls, women and girls. And here, these are victims of war in the, the ongoing war in Cameroon. And my, the first slide shows the, the, you can see the president of Youth Cameroon attending a workshop on the counseling on victims of war in the northern and southern region. And the other picture shows, you can see, a girls and women, a women and a girl, we were to be perpetrated a suicide, a, an attack, but fortunately they were caught but by military forces. In Cameroon, we are, we as civil society organization, face many obstacles to, to really involve in the field of disarmament. We are excluded from, we are excluded from um, some national processes. In 2016, we were contacted by, by UN Women and Ministry of Women Empowerment to conduct a basic study which later on served as the base of our national action plan. But since the, the, the national action plan was adopted, we were, we were pushing out, out of this sector and some organizations are involved to implement action regarding to the, this, this NAP. Com coming to the disarmament process, it's true Cameroon does not yet have a national commission on armed control, but the Ministry of External Relations is hosting, is hosting the, the permanent secretary of the armed control. But in many action or activity, carried out by the ministry, we are scaling involved. That is a challenge we are, we are, we are we still rising. Um, in one word, what I can say is that we are not, we don't, we lack, we lack enough national support in our, in our activity, in our day-to-day -day, um, functioning. But this does not stop or, or limit us in our work. We undergo, we, we used to undertake many training, many advocacy, and many uh, many action to to sensitize on the the the, the instrument the armed control instrument in Cameroon concerning the Kinshasa Convention. These are some action we, we have undertaken. This is a community sensitization with the grassroots population of the on the danger on illicit proliferation on of arm in Cameroon, and also we did advocacy. Uh, community awareness campaign. Uh, one of the one main action we did, and which have a result, is the the we work with media to sensitize them on the importance to vote, to popularize Kinshasa Convention and arms trade treaty as far as the Killer Robot camp campaign. 
coming to the king IATT we also carry out many many action to to first of all to popularize the ATT and then to to make the Camo to to for Cameroonian to for, for Cameroon country to to ratify the arms trade treaty and one main result we have is that in 2018 the Cameroon finally adopted the the arms trade arms trade treaty and it's our uh, sec section based in New York who call us to inform us that Cameroon has deposited the instrument to ratify the the arms trade treaty at the UN permanent secretary in New York. Apart from those initiatives, women in Cameroon also carry out, out some initiatives to, to, to call on the separatists as far as the government to seize the fire, as you can see in, the, in this slide. In this slide. Apart from this, we are, we are really involved in the implementation of AM-33 Kinshasa Convention as far as killer robot. But we're still facing many challenges to many challenges, and the main one is the main was the main challenges is related to to the funding. But before coming to the funding, we come with Cameroon. We we interact with some donors, as we have the, our main donors is reaching critical will. We also have Killer Robot, ICANN, and IANSA to implement an action on the field, but. It's true you have some some funding, but the, the funding are not sufficient enough to help us carry out all our initiatives. The main coming to the funding, what challenge we have is the, is that the government sometimes um, say that we are receiving funding from a senior donor and we use the funding to destabilize our, our country. And and since two thousand and fifteen. With Cameroon is facing many many security challenges. Most of the time, the, our office is broken, our uh, computer is stolen, and the, the president of Uganda once most of times at least three times she has been victim of uh, attacks, robber attacks, and laptop, internet, USB keys, all of these. Uh, they, all of this taken by by the Robert Bird stand thanks thanks to what we do we we are clear in our work and still now we do not have any formal notification of the work any formal notification telling us that the work we are doing is not good for the the security of our country and also women see, women lack uh, women are not well um, trained on the field of disarmament and we also lack information as concerning the disarmament the disarmament issue and also even uh, internet is a great challenge for us i was supposed to record this video yesterday there wasn't lights there wasn't internet so these are some challenges african women as Cameroonian women face to 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 really involve the, the, themselves in the field of disarmament uh, Last year, we, we also have a challenge with COVID-19 pandemic because we carry out, we, we wrote a project on to, to evaluate the disarmament, the, the DDR process in Cameroon. This project was a, is a really important because it, it's, it, it helped us in, in to, to really have the, the, an appraisal of the, the, the situation in Cameroon concerning the, 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 the qualification of arms. But till now, we do not we did not receive any funding to to carry out the, to, to carry out this project as perspective what we, we expect what we expect, what we are trying to do now is to to engage men to support women initiative in the disarmament process one main example we have is the masculinity project the masculinity project is a project which which, which aim to involve men in the the field of uh, to, in, to involve men to support initiative women are uh, carry out uh, carry on in the in the field of disarmament these are some these are few what i can say about the work we have do, we have been doing in cameroon concerning our disarmament program i am free to to uh, to to, uh, to answer to your question 
and on any other explanation about my presentation. Thanks. Thank you. So, yes, is it working? I think so. Uh, thank you so much, Armel, for this presentation. I think it was really interesting. And the fact that you highlighted that disarmament right now does face a lot of more problem in the global south, such as sometimes the lack of light or internet, and then COVID happened. And it just makes everyone work harder for something that is already not easy to do, which is to have women in decision-making sphere to do, to do the work. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that if they have questions, whether it's for our mail or whether it's for Suhair, they can still ask it in the chat because we're in contact with them through WhatsApp and therefore they'll be able to answer through us. And I do believe even that our mail managed to join us. So if she cannot uh, load a video or a voice uh, because of her internet connection, she still might be able to answer to your question in the group chat. So do not hesitate to ask questions there. Uh, and she's there. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Armel. And finally, I'd like to introduce to our last but not least, to our least but not la last but not least speaker, uh, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath. Uh, she will tell us about the obstacles and opportunities for women in India and South Asia. Uh, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath is an educationist, a founder director of WISCOM that promotes the leadership of South Asian women in the areas of peace, international affairs, and regional cooperation. She's also Chair, Board of Governors, Center for Policy Research, New Delhi, and Principal Emerita of Lady Sri Ram College, New Delhi. A member of multi-track peace initiative in the South Asian region, she's the first woman to have served on National Security Advisory Board of India. Minakshi's work and publication focus on gender, security, conflict transformation, and education. She has also received national and international awards for work in the field of education and peace building. The floor is yours. Oh, I think you're still on mute, uh, Minakshi. Thank you, Ivanur and Nancy. Um, it's such a pleasure and a privilege to be here with all of you today. Uh, and a special thanks, really, uh, to Scrap for opening up the space for these uh, truly uh, meaningful conversations in true feminist tradition. Uh, and also to have to, be, to join Kaila, Armel and Suhair in this conversation. It's, it's, uh, it's a joy and a delight. Um, your work really makes uh, despair unconvincing and hope practical. And I think we need a lot of that. Uh, I think it was Camus, I, I think who had said at one point that great ideas come into this world as gently as doves. And if you're able to listen attentively, uh, you will hear amid the uproar of empires and nations, the flutter of wings, the gentle stirrings of life and hope. And I think that's what Scrap affords us today in, in an otherwise not a particularly encouraging environment globally. Um, I, I was so delighted that Suhair uh, uh, alluded to human security. And I think in a sense that is the peg on which our work really stands. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, the South Asian economist Mahbubul Haq who gave it the most evocative kind of, of, of uh, interpretation when he said human security is a child that did not die, a disease that did not spread, a job that was not cut, an ethnic tension that did not explode in violence, a dissident who was not silenced, and that human security is really a concern with human life and dignity and not about weapons. So when uh, WISCOM uh, was, uh, was set up in 1999, it was this kind of understanding around the twin axes of freedom from fear and freedom from want that we actually mounted our work. When we entered the field of peace and security, it was largely untenanted by women uh, in the formal sense of the term. Uh, we, we were hoping to facilitate the leadership of women in the areas of peace, diplomacy, and international affairs. There was a great deal of diffidence among women. And the idea was therefore to encourage younger women to enter the field. 
So how did we do this? We set ourselves up as a research and praxi initiative, looking primarily both at discourse transformation and also engaging in practice and on the field engagement. And so we saw ourselves as a bridge between policy, the academia and the NGO sectors. And I remember as early as 1998, 1998 we actually derived a great deal of inspiration from, from Kyla's organization, WISE uh, in Washington. And it was a true example of sisterhood across borders and boundaries. And I wanted to just acknowledge that because of her presence here today. And we actually talked about gender then as a cross-cutting idea. And that was the lead motive of our work. It was really bringing new entrants into the field to interact with senior professionals. It was experience and potential coming together in a non-hierarchical space in all our trainings, in all our workshops and so on. We also were particularly conscious that we needed to have men involved. Um, our approach was intersectional. We brought this intersectional sensibility. And in the South Asian region, you know, we are driven by false lines of caste, class, religion, and so on. So this plurality or pluriversality was very important for our work. And we, the link between toxic masculinity and cultures of militarism. And therefore, it was essential and crucial for us to bring in men, to educate them, and to also take them along as partners. Because as women, we were not going to be ghettoized. We were not only going to speak to so-called the soft women's issues, but we would like to offer an alternative paradigm of peace, security, and development. When we came in, I mean, we did have several training workshops between Indians and Pakistanis. You know, these two countries have been in conflict for so many decades. And I'm happy to share that we have over 500 alumni who are still in touch with each other across these seemingly impermeable borders and boundaries. When we started our work, we didn't have the luxury of the normative framework of 1325. Uh, although we were working already implicitly with the ideas that 1325 has foregrounded since then, we worked with the Beijing platform, a normative framework and with CEDAW. Today you have 1325 plus plus, you have the SDGs, and more importantly, you have resolution 6569, the first ever re resolution that has dared to address the role of women in arms control and disarmament. And of course, you have the most encouraging TPNW, uh, which, you know, according to Scrap itself, offers an incredible window of opportunity to change the, uh, the discourse. So, uh, but I, I do want to flag here that both 1325 and 16, uh, 65, 69 was very much in keeping with the ethos that you wish to promote was piloted in the UN by small countries. Uh, you know, uh, 65, 69 by Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, which had its first woman prime minister uh, come in and push the agenda, Kamla Prashad Bishesha. And in 1325, of course, you know, was piloted in the UN uh, by Bangladesh. But it built on the work of so many women's organizations the world over, WILF, uh, International Alert, uh, Women Peace, Peacemakers Program, and the whole range of um, NGO, uh, INGO activity. So today we have an, an incredible opportunity, and especially after uh, uh, the UN resolution 2558 in 2020 that has very clearly linked uh, and established the connection between development, peace, security, and human rights and sustainable peace. And so we have to now again look at not just, not just overt violence, but also the structural causes of conflict, exclusions, inclusions, and the state, the role of the state itself especially in the, in the global South. And in our own work in gendering security, as I said, we try to build on the two axes of human security. And so our work consequently was attempt to craft an alternative vocabulary, provide a new lexicon to counter the male-centric militarist discourse on security, consciously moving away from ethnocentric, uh, anthropocentric even, and androcentric 
notions uh, of, of security towards a more inclusive, empathic understanding of people's security away from Westphalian notions of realpolitik and, and approaches of realism. So this opening up this discourse is also about the ability to speak to difference, to, dif to different voices, infusing a kind of pluriversality into this discussion on arms control, disarmament, security, and peace. And it's also resting it out of smoke-filled rooms filled with men in black suits that, uh, that you often refer to in your webinars in, at, at uh, Scrap. And, and I'd also like to use the word bringing yin intelligence. And yin intelligence is a, is a concept that's been offered by Sila Elworthy at the Oxford Research Group, which is talking about a different way of looking at peace, uh, uh, peace and security, moving away from the binaries and the linearities and what is called strategic thinking. And uh, we would like to actually move also away from a reductivist approach, which looks at men, men make war and women make peace. No, that's not the way we want to go. We want to understand why women who are in a particular structural framework of power differentials have all of this loaded against them in terms of not finding voice in the issues and the decision-making processes where they are most affected as in conflict and in violence. Uh, and, and, and there are these processes that undervalue their experience and therefore we want to foreground them, amplify them, reclaiming agency, breaking the silence of women. And the idea is to democratize security and not to securitize democracy. So we, we want to also unscramble uh, the fetishized and reified techno-strategic discourse. And so if you want to talk about it, we want to humanize it, we want to go beyond deterrence vocabularies and we want to use linguistic deterrence. Like we don't, we stop using words that obfuscate and con confuse like collateral damage strike capacity of missiles, which have always been an area of diffidence for women and talk about the real people that are impacted. And we do, and so uh, the reason I say this is this is inbuilt into our mentoring programs because you had asked me to speak about what is the structure of our mentoring. We also recognized that we need to open the accordion when we talk about disarmament a bit uh, and recognize that it's a war on multiple fronts. It's the personal, it's also looking at internal disarmament. So there's a lot of inner work that needs to be done, especially in the peace building field. We believe that it's cultural, cultures of militarism. In South Asia, for example, we had some very powerful women heads of state. And it was very natural to compliment them by calling them the only men in their cabinet. Now that tells you what a travesty it is uh, to talk about women in the context of being the only men in their cabinet and praising them for that. We also have another strange custom here that when men are supposed to be less masculinist, we say, oh, why don't you wear bangles? If you can't get down to being decisive and forceful and powerful, you might as well wear bangles. Therefore, devaluing the experiences of women and the inner power they can manifest. Then of course, there is a, in addition to the cultural, there's a whole military economic complex that has to be uh, uh, sort of in a, in a sense uh, exposed. There is pol the political aspect of disarmament. We have rising populism today. We have, this is reinforcing jingoism, male populist leaders. Uh, it's it's uh, really about, uh, uh, you know, devaluing this yin intelligence. Uh, that and we've seen it in the context of COVID, the securitization of a huge health tragedy that's going on. So we attempt to change mindset and interrogate why disarmament is only limited to arms control. It's not. It's something much, much wider than that. And which is why I want to also acknowledge here the work of BASIC uh, in the UK and, uh, and the University of Birmingham that are trying to look move away from this notion of uh, responsible nuclear states to the idea of nuclear responsibilities and moving away from the blame game, uh, trying to build an alternative vocabulary, looking at you know, security, uh, security dilemma sensibility to arrive at understanding that linking weapons to security is the wrong way 
to completely begin. So coming in here, I also want to quickly move to the South Asian women's uh, movements in, in, in a sense, because part of the praxis that we do in our mentoring is also linking young people to this stream of women's feminist movements, not just women's, feminist movements. Now, way before 1325, starting from the 1970s onwards, women in South Asia have been looking at, have been engaging with a whole gamut of what today is constituted as security issues. You know, earlier the development world and the security world worked in silos. Thanks to the SDGs, there is a full foregrounding of the link between gender development, security, and peace. But women in South Asia always worked across these silos. And uh, for, whether it was in the 70s, you had the Chipko movement, which was something like the Green Belt movement, where you had women uh, protecting the trees from the maraudering uh, corporates that wanted to deforest for, for profit. You had women protesting uh, missile sites. Uh, in the 70s, even uh, before, well, not before, around the time that the Greenham Commons uh, uh, experience was, was, was unfolding. And, and also the idea was not mainstreaming women's concerns. It was about providing an alternative civic sphere, not mainstreaming women into a muddy stream or, or, or sort of accepting uh, the meta narratives on international peace and security. I do want to say here, they were, they were picketing nuclear sites. They were opposing large dams that had caused displacement. They were looking at issues of, um, of right to information, which kept women out of democratic processes. They were the mothers movements in Sri Lanka, in, uh, in, in India and across Southern Asia that were protesting the disappearance of, of soldiers and erstwhile combatants. There were also organizations that were primarily talking about impunity of the armed forces. There was this great dramatic movement of the mothers of Manipur, which is in the Northeast of India, that stripped themselves naked in front of the Kangla fort to oppose the whole issue of impunity of the armed forces. And as you know, in, the, in South Asia, especially in areas of conflict, Women face two armed patriarchies, the, uh, the arms of the militants, as well as, as that of the securitized state. And very often they serve as minesweepers, they uh, serve as shields, military shields and so on. But much of this experience is not visible in the international discourse on peace and security. We would like to visibilize that. We would like to say that from South Asia, there are lessons that we can all learn together. If I am, and also women are not, uh, shall I say, afflicted by the cartographic anxieties of nation states. They are able to build transversal solidarities across borders and boundaries, you know, as women have done between India and Pakistan, even at the height of the Kargil, post Kargil conflict, there was this famous bus of, for peace where Indian women to went across the border uh, to, to, to meet and make peace on the other side. Uh, there, there was a women's action forum in Pakistan that apologized to their sisters in Bangladesh for the excesses that the Pakistani army had committed during their war of independence. There are legions and legions and legions of disobedient women who are crafting a new dialogue, a new uh, a, a, a new uh, vocabulary on peace. I, I'm running out of time. I have a lot more to say, but I do want to point to one particular area, which is the ubiquity of camps. And I think this is something that the disarmament discourse needs to. If you look at the Rohingya, say example in, in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, it is a metonym for the absolute shredding of human dignity, the absolute dislocation be in a dehumanizing at its worst. It's a wash with arms. It's it is a, it's kind of explicit um, in, in in dramatically explicit in all types of conflict that proliferate there. So if we want to look at disarmament, we also have to look at this twin axis, this di di dyad of victimhood and agency, 
and try and claim agency for women. That's one image, the bleak image of the Rohingya camp. The other image is of the women making peace across borders and boundaries. So in negotiating these contradictions is this large piece of peace building. And this is where we want to bring mentorship in for young people, both men and women, to understand the complexities, the struggle of moving from peace, from, uh, from war and conflict and violence against women to sustainable, sustained peace. So I just end with that wonderful quote from William uh, Ross, uh, Walter Ross, he says, that the woods were made for the hunters of dreams, the, the, the brooks for the fisher of songs, for those who hunt for the gunless game, the streams and the woods belong. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Meenakshi, for, again, such an eye-opening and interesting presentation, um, including speaking about mentoring and training obstacles and opportunities for women across the world, and also specifically in India and South Asia, and also for speaking about the role of feminist perspectives for the future of sustainable disarmament, which of course, as, as you were speaking, includes a need to break down patriarchal power structures and notions of masculinity. And I also couldn't agree uh, more with your expert view on how disarmament needs to be considered so much broader and more inclusive in a much more intersectional way, um, which takes human security to its core. So thank you so much for your presentation. Without further ado, we will move to the Q&A. And I would like to um, start with a question open to all panelists, which relates back to funding. Um, and it's from a, a participant. Do you think current funding arrangements encourage turf wars and competition between people and groups who are natural allies? If so, how do you think people and groups can address and overcome this? I was wondering if Kayla would, uh, would you like to start this off, this question off? Yes, um, I mean, absolutely. I can see my fellow panelists uh, nodding their heads as well. I think that this is something that is very prevalent and especially in times of um, crises or in situations where there is increased conflict or um, tensions because um, like I was saying that the funding for crises is typically overshad or overshadows a lot of work that um, gender and women led organizations typically work on a lot of these issues and when crises come up they typically overshadow and take funding away um, from these organizations that are already working on security and development issues. So I think that um, it's definitely leads to turf wars. It leads to um, a lot of people trying to take money from the same small pot of money that exists. And what I think a solution to that is focusing on promoting women's leadership in especially funding areas, but in all decision-making spaces and illustrating the importance of a gender perspective in these issues and in areas where there are there is a tendency to lead to these kind of as um, the attendees as these turf wars um, and funding for situations where there is more tension or conflict or crises it needs to include funding opportunities for pre-existing women-led and gender-focused organizations to kind of mitigate these turf wars that could exist. Thank you. If anyone else wants to jump on the, the question, okay. or oh, we we'll move uh, on. There was, there, there was a, a particular issue that Kyla raised uh, about these turf wars. Um, if you are located in, in, this, in South Asia, for example, and you're working at the grassroots level, the whole structure of international funding is really incomprehensible because the, the methodology of putting in a project proposal itself is so intimidating. It's a different language, it's a different syntax. And you have to therefore learn it 
And then also the reporting mechanisms, the log frames and so on, the EU, EU funding is, is even more difficult, which is why building solidarities, like for example, WISE did for Wiscom, uh, and taking on what is known as the spirit of universal responsibility and recognizing that helping one small initiative is helping women everywhere. To look at that, you know, to be able to communicate the interconnections. After all, feminist praxis is about connections, building connections, seeing them where they have been invisibilized. In, in many parts of South Asia, uh, the governments, uh, nationalist governments are dissuading um, civil society organizations from accepting funding from what they call foreign sources. They've made it extremely difficult because the reporting, the surveillance and the monitoring is so stringent that very often uh, small organizations have to forego funding uh, because they just can't keep up. The administrative uh, know-how that is required for that is almost much more than the amount of energy that you need to spend in, in the field. So um, I think building this kind of solidarity, uh, Kyla mentioned uh, UN Women. Now even UN Women is grappling for funds, is, is, is not flush with funds. And this is happening at a time where in 2019, the, spend, the global spend on arms was the highest ever in that decade, the highest ever. And in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, the global spend on arms was 4% more than what it was in 2019. So you know where the priorities are going. And Kyla very, very, very deftly pointed to that. The, the conundrum is, how can we come together to raise this as a major, major issue? Uh, in addition to just funding, also human rights monitors, women need protection. How do you provide for that protection? How do you make sure they are safe in the areas? How do you provide insurance for them? How do you look after, I mean, how do you take care of their caregiving giving functions? How do you ensure that their babies can come with them when they come into these spaces? So there is a whole range of, of issues. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Minakshi. Amel, would you have something to add to that or should we move on to the next question? We cannot hear you at the moment. I don't think we can hear you. Um, what you can do is maybe type your answer in the chat so people can. Is it just me or Nancy, do you? Yeah, I think there's, Amel, we're struggling to hear you, but if you can type in the chat, that would be, that would be great. Yeah, I think the best possibility would be for you to type your answer in the chat and I'll be more than happy to read it out loud. Uh, also, before I move to the next attendee's question, uh, if you have a question amongst panelists, do not hesitate uh, to just raise your hand or just make me a sign and you can ask one or the other. Well, Kayla just raised her hand. <laughs> exactly. So Kayla, you can go ahead and then I'll take uh, next the attendee's question uh, towards Minakshi. I've just so enjoyed hearing from um, my fellow panelists. I've just, I feel like this has just been very, um, for me, invigorating to hear and to hopefully move forward on some of these issues. So one thing that I was thinking of a lot when I was hearing um, from Armel and um, Dr. Mesh, all of you is that we're looking at the structure that has been set up and it's a, almost a traditional security view of how funding and these structures work and you all kind of touched on this at some point but it's i think speaks to a lot of the questions that have been asked and that are a lot of the points that have been made and my question for all of you is and i think i think um, Manashi, you just touched on this a little bit building that solidarity but how do we 
gain funding in this current system when it's not necessarily set up in the best way for us to gain funding, if that makes sense. And how do we, um, I think one thing that Manashi, you said that we need to democratize security, not securitize democracy. And it's, I think that was a very good point. We need to make sure that we're working together to within the system. But my question is, how do we work with a system that was not set up with organizations such as ours in mind and with uh, progress towards gender equality and initiatives focusing on a gender perspective in disarmament that weren't set up in this way? And I know that's a very big question and probably deserves a separate um, whole discussion, but I'd love to hear all of your insights into this. And I think this speaks a little bit to a couple of uh, questions that were um, proposed in the chat as well. Thank you very much for that. Also, just as you raise your hand, I'd like to remind uh, attendees that they can also raise their hand if they want to talk live with us and ask the question. Uh, but as I promised earlier, I'll take a question that we got from Anna uh, to Dr. Minakshi. She's asking, with your experience working in peace, security and development before Resolution 1325, what main differences do you see for women entering in disarmament before and after the implementation of the resolution? Um, is this for me? Is this yes. For me? Okay. It is Thank for you. you. Uh, well, you know, actually, what it did, what the resolution did do, is that it gave us a global normative framework. But having done that, we know that there are some inherent difficulties, especially from the global southern perspective, that we must make sure that 1325 and its implementation doesn't end up being just a sanitized indicator driven exercise. We have to make sure that civil society is deeply invested in it and that we don't just leave it to the states. And I'll tell you how this happened. For example, countries like India do not have a nap. In South Asia, there are only two countries, Nepal and Afghanistan that have a national action plan. Many of the other countries do not recognize or do not formally accept that they have conflict within the state. Because if you, if you implicitly, if you acknowledge 1325, you also acknowledge that you have conflict. Now, this is one way of getting around and not acknowledging that. So what women's organizations did was that they invoked General Resolution 30, the GR30 under the CEDAW, now, these countries have signed on to the CEDAW in order to foreground the special role for women in situations of conflict. So all I'm really trying to say is that as women, and this might answer Kyla's question as well, we have to constantly find creative methodologies to address trenchant questions. Now, and, and there is something, there is a sort of intuitive link to this collective feminist unconscious, uh, something like a union collective unconscious, where you know women in one part of the world intuitively pick up what their foremothers have done in other parts of the world. For example, the Greenham Commons women, the, the women in South Africa who looked in, into the TRC, people who may never have read about them are in some ways replicating those for example, the farmers' movements in India today, where, the women, where women are in the front lines the of the agitation, they're doing a lot of the things that their foremothers have done in other parts of the world. There is a collective unconscious that we are dipping into. There is a palimpsest, and we need to, you know, somehow visualize that. Uh, we have to find creative ways about how do we overturn a very conventional method of looking at disarmament, perhaps starting with scrap and this, this wonderful group that is here, we could bring out a little charter on what funding should not be doing and how not to fund. And perhaps just drawing on those experiences, bring out a small little monograph on what we recommend and then put forward a collective request. So for example, if someone is looking at small arms in the global south or anywhere else how do how do we build those transversal solidarity so that everybody benefits 
I want to also recommend to all of us, there's this fabulous work that is being done by Scylla Elworthy of the erstwhile Oxford Research Group. She's brought out this very good book called The Business Plan for Peace, where she's talked about how planning, uh, uh, funding for peace for the corporates can be a profitable endeavor. And to suggest that there is sense in investing in peace. And um, I mean, if, if you can bring Scylla to your conversations, she would really lay it out. And perhaps that is a, a, a kind of plan that we can all use collectively instead of reinventing the wheel. I don't know, Kyla, if I've answered your question, but you raised such an important issue. It's a long struggle. The battle for freedom is never done and the field is never quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Meenakshi and Kayla for posing the question. Um, we've just learned so much from, from both of you with um, the question and the answers. So thank you. We, um, we managed to speak with Suhair, our other panelist via WhatsApp. Unfortunately, as Suhair has mentioned, she has technical issues um, which is why unfortunately she's not able to join live with us but we did pose a question to Sahar, and we think it's important to um, share her answer. We asked Sahar that according to her presentation how she talked about how women have a particular analysis which is important and is needed to raise awareness of the impact of weapons in their communities in for example in Sudan and also at the government level. And we asked Suhair if she could develop and how these uh, interactions is received at the government levels that she works with. And if there is any support from government, government organizations or also civil society organizations in Sudan or across the region to help with funding obstacles or practical obstacles that Suhair has spoken about and also all of the panelists have um, spoken about today. So I'll just read our answer. She answered to us that the government institutions are supposed to support women and their communities. An example of that is Sudan Commission for GDR and Ministry of Social Welfare. But it seems not a priority in many ways. The alternative for that, for that is local leaders who support our work and other civil society bodies. Also due to limited funds for women and disarmament, for women, disarmament is not a priority for the government. But still, the awareness and capacity building activity can be afforded by internal funding and cooperation between different stakeholders and partners. She believes the social media is a good alternative to share and disseminate message on disarmament and peace issues to different segments of society. As, as she mentioned in the presentation, the funding theme in many cases do not meet the goal and needs for their communities. Great. Um... I would also like, we, we also similarly um, posed a question to Armel on WhatsApp. So um, if I just read the, the question out that we asked Armel and um, even or will provide the answer as well. So we asked Armel, um, according to her presentation, that she spoke about the political challenges again and the barriers to Wilp of Cameroon's work especially with regards to um, funding restrictions and also the lack of national acknowledgement for the work that Wilp of Cameroon do. And we, we asked Armel, how do you try to overcome these challenges? She mentioned in her presentation that she worked with the media, but we asked what were the challenges here because of the rather harsh political stance? And if Armel has any insights as to whether these issues are more prevalent and serious for women-led organizations, or if in fact it's just a national problem for all NGOs and civil society organizations working in disarmament in Cameroon. So she gave us uh, a multiple, um, multiple answers for that. First, she liked to say that the first strategy they adopted uh, in the face of lack of support in the action, they were directly with community. Their actions are directed towards them and they no longer have to go through intermediaries. The second thing that they are fortunate enough is that the media is supportive of their cause and support and support their initiative. Generally, the awareness they raise through the media helps them thrive. However, she also would like to point out that the media hardly accompanies them 
in their actions because they are influenced by the government. And finally, uh, she believes that very few CSOs in Cameroon work in the field of arms control. They practically are the only CSOs of women really engaged in the field. Also, the challenges they face are very much inherent to them as Wolf Cameroon and not a global problem. This is why the, this is why they struggle to mobilize the fund that are granted of the results they produce and the impact of their action. Great. Now we we are running out of time, so we would like just to pose a final question um, to Minakshi and Kayla and Sahar and Amel if you are able to join. But do you have any hope for the future with funding and with the obstacles? that we have spoken um, about in this webinar. If we could ask just for a quick one, two minute uh, response to this question so we can wrap up in time for half past. Thank you. Kyla, beauty before age, Kyla. <laughs> I don't think that I quite qualify for that, but thank you. That's very kind. Um, I I would like to say I just um, again thank you so much for having me. This has been a very great conversation, and um, I think there's been some beautiful responses to uh, the questions, uh, both virtually and through text, and also on this video as well. Um, I'd like to just say that I think that there is hope. Um, I think that the you know, past few years, and especially the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, gives rise to hope. And I think without having hope that we, we should not be in this line of work either. Um, we also have seen a lot of improvements and progress and change is slow, but it's steady. And I think that one thing that we should hold on to is that accountability does go a long way um, for specifically in this area for quality continued funding. And I think a couple of things that can be improved with that is that we need to focus on including training on digital reporting, including um, data training and working to track where the money goes to show funders what's being done and why more and better and continuous Funder, funding is necessary. And I think that one of the ways that can be done, um, as Minashki so eloquently put it, was solidarity across um, sectors, across um, organizations and working together on that way. And another way I think is a great way to show accountability is, as I mentioned earlier, the scorecards. Um, countries and organizations and groups of people do not necessarily like to be ranked or scored lower. Um, if they are called out on that, it's, I think, a great way. The wide scorecard I mentioned earlier is a great example of this. When we published it, we sent it to all the think tanks that we were rating on how many women were on their board of directors or um, looking at the gender parity there. And one immediately within hours reached out to us and let us know they had just added one more woman to their board of directors. So it goes a long way to show the numbers and show what's going on, but I think that needs to be paired equally, if um, not less so, uh, less important than the solidarity that Minashki um, was talking about. So accountability and solidarity are the two things that lend us hope in this area. Thank you. Absolutely, there, there has to be hope. That's what propels us. Uh, let me share with you, you know, from initially being the last speaker on the last panel on any seminar on peace, security, and disarmament, we gradually inched our way up. We're now calling women to panels on security has become almost de rigueur. So that's, that's, you know, that's a great thing. Uh, the other aspect is that we really need to know, uh, you know, sort of, uh, visibilize that our daily resistances and everyday mutinies against patriarchy and the, 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 you know, the violence of family, community, and the state, and the complicities between them is always a step forward. Look at where we were 20 years ago and look at the fact that now young people like those who populate scrap are actually leading this discourse. And that is so encouraging, so, so, so encouraging. So we, we first of all shed the earlier image of 
women building peace as the woman in white passively holy or wholly passive, right? We've already come a long way since then. And, and I think like Kyla and in the hands of people like Kyla, Nancy, Evanor and, and the scrap team, there's so much potential. You're talking about opening up conversations, just having conversations and conversations and conversations will reach that critical mass where there will be a paradigm shift, uh, a democratized, democratized, democratized security. Uh, bring it into the heat and dust of subaltern aspirations, out of those smoke-filled rooms, out of those closed doors. And of course, there's hope. Otherwise, we should we should all just hang up our coats and go home, which we're not doing. And women Thank will you. never do that. Thank you. Thank you, Minakshi. Thank you, Kayla. Um, I think we'll have to call it here, unfortunately, which is a shame because it's been such a great conversation. There's so much more to discuss. But uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Nancy. I'm really sorry. Uh, I just saw Suhe raise her hand and I think she wanted to say something. So yes. hello. on this question, I'm sorry to interrupt. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. You can can go I ahead, say Absolutely, please. Yeah, thank you very much for presenting my speech. I'm very sorry for this technical. Uh, uh, I'm disappointed to not to join. Uh, it seems it's very distinguished uh, talk uh, about from the other uh, participant. Uh, uh, I think I can I can uh, watch it in the uh, YouTube. Is it? Is it be available? Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, this is great. For, yeah. You 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 shed lights on the uh, how to can we cooperate and can, can coordinate to 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 find other opportunities for for funding for disarmament. And this is uh, this is for me is uh, very brilliant. Uh, I will keep in touch. And I will uh, try to attend maybe another time. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Nancy, and the other um, participants. Okay. Thank That's you. Thank you, Sahar, thank you very much, thank you much for, for that. Um, this is the end now, but we do have two other webinars in our Feminist Disarmament um, webinar series. So please check out our website for details on this. And thank you everyone for attending. We hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did. And of course, a huge thank you to our four panelists, uh, Kayla, Minakshi, Suhair and Armel. Thank you everyone.